they've both intuited that celebrity is something that you can then leverage and turn into success, be it in business or politics or whatever. That's Chief New York Times television critic James Ponowazek. The Monroe, Michigan-born author has a new book out, Audience of One, Donald Trump, Television, and the Fracturing of America. So this is episode 359 of Your Daily Detroit for Wednesday, October 16th, 2019. I'm Jer Stays. So if you haven't figured out by now, I am a total media geek. You kind of have to be to start a podcast like this one from scratch. And in my previous lives, I've worked in major market TV stations, and for the last 20 years, usually behind the scenes, I've dealt with media in one way or another as a career. I've seen up front the power that media has, for better or for worse. And I'm fascinated by the decisions made, the incentives all the players have, and the impact that media has to change a community, whether it's a city like Detroit, the nation, or the world. This book caught my eye because it's kind of a look behind the curtain involving our media landscape and our current president, who became nationally known by using the power of television and the media. So since James, a University of Michigan grad, is coming through town this month as part of the fall Metro Detroit Book and Author Luncheon, that's this October 21st at Burton Manor in Livonia, I thought it would be a good time to talk with him. Before we get into it, episodes like these are only possible thanks to our members like you. If you want to push Detroit's conversation forward, join us as a Patreon member at dailydetroit.com slash join. And if you want to link to tickets to the Book and Author Luncheon, I'll put a link for that to bookandauthor.org in the show notes. Let's get started. Joining me on the line is James Ponowazek. He is the author of Audience of One, Donald Trump, Television and the Fracturing of America. James, welcome to Daily Detroit. Thanks for having me. I, I think what's important about this book is you really dive into the impact that television has made on American culture, especially in the last you know couple of decades. Um, I would agree. <laughs> you know, as a, as a yeah, I, I am obviously biased in that regard, but um, you know, a, as a TV critic, I think that one thing that is different about TV as a medium from you know movies, art, music, whatever, is that it is both uh, you know an art and entertainment form, and it is a a conduit for communication. Uh, you know, you don't go to the movies to see a presidential debate, you know, that, that sort of thing. So, so, so it, it, it is in part and has become kind of the, the nervous system of our culture and politics and the way we communicate with each other and the means through which campaigns are carried out. So when the format and the archetypes and the, the 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 tone and format of TV changes. You know, I think necessarily in a lot of ways, our, our culture and and politics change. That format change is something that I'd like to kind of pull on as a thread because it's one of those things of like television draws audiences uh, like no other, and it, it really like captivates people. But I think a lot of people think about television drawing people in for the stuff that entertains them, but especially with the rise of cable news, it has become a primary driver of the conversation. And some of the incentives that television and television producers have to create interesting television, I wonder how that affects the conversation around our democracy, our policy, and our issues. I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, but but just to take one, you know, blatant example is that In America, you know, we have only very limited public broadcasting, and so therefore, uh, television is a business. So what goes on TV is, you know, what makes money, and that applies even to journalism, even if TV journalism also, uh, you know, theoretically answers to some higher principles. Uh, So, you know, there has always been a concern, even when TV news was considered more of a public trust. Uh, about what would draw an audience and what audiences would respond to. Now, one thing that has changed over you know, the most recent decades as cable news 
has become a bigger and bigger portion of TV news is that uh, by its nature, it has kind of different, you know, Im- imperatives than old fashioned broadcast news where you would program a half hour of news an evening. Uh, cable news is on 24 hours. And part of what that means is that it's business motive is to give people reasons to tune in all the time, even if there isn't big breaking news going on, even if there is nothing exciting to report. And that encourages, you know, a kind of tone of sensationalism. It, it, it encourages promoting arguments and sometimes staging arguments because arguments are exciting. Uh, it creates this kind of frenzied, sensationalistic, uh, attitude and you know, kind of tempo to the news that then informs and seeps into everything that's discussed on the news, including politics. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the language that TV news uses for politics is, you know, prize fight like and pro wrestling like uh, because it, like everything else, has to draw and excite a big audience. That makes me think of a couple of things. The last uh, election coverage I watched, I noted how much it looked like sports coverage, even with like a field, something that looked like a field on the set, that it felt like I was watching a halftime show for a football game as opposed to like the election of of the country. And, And your point makes me think of, and I don't know how you feel about this moment, but The moment that Jon Stewart had, I don't know if you remember this, there's this YouTube clip that's gone viral years ago. Jon Stewart was on CNN's Crossfire with Paul Begala and I think Tucker Carlson, who is... Tucker Carlson, yeah. Yeah, still a voice to this day. And it that clip impressed me because it was like a look like it felt like he pulled the curtain back and I felt like in a way it helped propel Jon Stewart's career as somebody who's a comedian but people look to as a a guide of like a guiding light for a certain group of people obviously not all people I made a special effort to come on the show today because I have uh, privately amongst my friends and also in occasional newspapers and television shows (laughs) mentioned uh, this show as being uh, uh, bad <laughs> and, and and I wanted to I felt that that wasn't fair and I should come here and, and tell you that I don't it's not so much that it's bad as it's hurting America. <laughs> so I, I wanted to but come here today let me, and say wait wait no, I just, no, let me hear here, here, here's just what, what I wanted to tell you guys. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> stop 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 hurting America. Okay. Now let me, and and let come work here. for us because <laughs> we as the people How do you pay? The people, not not well. Better than CNN, I'm sure. <laughs> but you can sleep at night. See, the, the the thing is, we need your your help. You're right now. You're helping the politicians and the the the, the corporations, and we're left out Wait, there I to mow our lawns. Just said we're too rough on them when they make mistakes. No, no, no. You're not too rough on them. You're part of their strategies. You're partisan. Um, what do you call it? Hacks. <laughs> Wait, Sean. Wait. Like, what do you think about moments like that? I wonder. Like, is this good for us? Um, I mean, John Stewart obviously <laughs> definitely wondered if it it was good for us. You know, that was sort of the point of that encounter. And I, I think I think he had it right in the the larger sense. You know, John Stewart's Daily Show in many ways was basically a critique of the media sphere that cable news had created. You know, focused on a lot of things. But particularly, its bread and butter was 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 cable news. Um, and at that time, I, in his in his showdown with the hosts of, of Crossfire, I believe it was in 2004, maybe 2003. Uh, you know, he wasn't so much arguing about a particular political point or you know a partisan political effect, but he was pushing against this notion of presenting the news as a constant fight for ratings. And Crossfire is sort of the patient zero of that. You know, that was really one of the first, you know, before Fox News even existed, uh, before there were all these various partisan political news outlets, Crossfire started in the fledgling days of CNN, I think in 1982 or something like that. And it is, you know, it it was sort of the, the quintessential example of the idea of how do you get a news audience worked up whether something's happening or not? Well, one thing is to have a reliable programming that you control where somebody from the left fights with somebody on the right. 
you know, this was a thing that had been done in TV news before, you know, point counterpoint on 60 minutes or whatever, uh, but this really institutionalized it and it became kind of the voice of cable news. And just to get one example of how that voice of cable news bleeds over into politics and affects it, Pat Buchanan, one of the first hosts of Crossfire, ran for president in 1992 and challenged George Bush in the Republican primary and nearly upset him and, you know, arguably helped wound George H.W. Bush's campaign so much that, that he ended up losing. Uh, you know, Pat Buchanan was, was in a way a kind of proto-Trump figure, you know, in that he was a populist conservative figure who owed his political influence entirely to his performance on television. You know, that performance on television, it makes me think of like celebrity in general. I feel like Kim Kardashian and Donald Trump have a lot in common because they're both yep. famous for being famous. Uh, they're, they're, they're famous for being famous. They have both intuited that celebrity is something that you can then leverage and turn into success, be it in business or politics or whatever. Right. Kim Kardashian was, you know, quote unquote, famous for being famous and then very candidly leveraged that profile into all these actual money making business sell offs. Right. Uh, you know, building that that sort of brand and becoming famous just for being a, a, a flamboyant or attention getting personality is something in a highly mediated culture that you can figure out how to turn into money or to turn into political power. Uh, and, you know, to, to, to extend the comparison, they're also both figures who owe their success not only to traditional TV, but to being very canny and savvy with the use of social media to sort of forge a bond, this kind of intimate bond with the followings that they have. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's it's it's I, I, I think there's no small parallel between Trump and somebody like 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 Kim or Kanye, you know, these, these sort of uh, social media era celebrities. And in a way, he was doing that sort of thing before social media existed. When I think about that, even just going back in time to that John Stewart crossfire conversation, media has fractured in so many ways on television, on social media for, for listeners who maybe aren't as like they've always lived. It's kind of like when you're in the water, you, you just, you just are in the water. You don't know the, what it was before you. What, how much fracturing have we seen in the last 10, 20, 30 years of television and media? Give people a little bit of like a, uh, an understanding. Well, just to cover the, the arc of the book, because the, the, uh, my book is sort of structured as a dual story of, you know, Donald Trump, the, the celebrity and media character, and the, the evolution of the media environment that he, he lived in. Um, and when he um, first emerged as a figure, um, and, and I, I, I focus on his first appearance on the Today Show in 1980, um, that was an entirely different TV universe. I mean, TV was a big force in the culture then, it was a big force now, but back then it was a three network medium. You know, basically you had NBC, ABC, CBS, and all these networks divided up this vast audience between them. Now, what does that mean? Why should, why should that matter? How does that affect the actual content? Well, when everything that's on TV has to draw an audience of tens of millions in order to stay on the air. You end up with an imperative that, you know, sort of everything kind of needs to be for everybody. You need to present either a TV show or a personality as broadly appealing and not too antagonistic, not too off-putting, because you don't want to give people reasons to change the channel. As you get more media outlets, as you get hundreds of cable channels, thousands of websites, you know, thousands of podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. You end up with the, the media and the media audience fragmented into smaller and smaller groups. And the, the business model, the media model for all the outlets becomes not avoiding alienating anybody, but putting, but producing things that are not for everybody, but that intensely serve the interests of a small group. And that gives you everything from you know the sort of brilliant niche 
cable entertainment programming that you see on channels like HBO and AMC to highly partisan cable news and talk radio and, and, and podcasts and so forth. Um, it, it, it means that in the area of politics, people are much more used to hearing things that are targeted to them and their particular interest groups. Uh, and there is less and less common ground because there are fewer and fewer sort of common arenas uh, for for the you know, for, for for the media audience in general, uh, so it's 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 a business story in part because the evolution of media is always partly business, but because media is a form of communication, it really affects the kind of ideas that are prevalent in society and the tone in which we communicate them to each other, and and whether you know any of us listen to anything altogether anymore, or whether we are hearing highly individualized arguments pitched at just ourselves. It makes me wonder, I guess, two things. One, can it get better? And do you have any ideas on how it could get better? And does it need to get better? I mean, I don't think that uh, media fragmentation changes in the media. I I don't think of myself as, you know, a, a, a sort of scold who believes that television has just set the country to hell and it's gotten worse and worse and worse as, as a result of that. Now, I'm a TV critic. I, I, I love television or I wouldn't do this job. Um, and I think that there are a lot of benefits to media fragmentation, uh, you know, as well as the dangers of polarization, et cetera. Uh, you have more kinds of voices represented that, you know, used to just get shunted out of mainstream programming. You have more opportunities for, for you know, people to, uh, to, to uh, get their voices into the conversation. I think that that is all good. Um, I think that the only way to, you know, improve the effects of media is for people who use the media to try to deliver better messages to it. That, that is to say, you can use a highly fragmented media to, you know, foment polarization and the the idea of seeing everybody else as your your enemy. Um, but that's not the only kind of message that you can communicate. You know, you can use the, that that same media to argue for inclusion, for the notion that it is possible for you know things to improve for everybody without having you know without your success having to, to come at a cost to somebody else. But I think it's important to be conscious of how media works because if you don't use this megaphone to tell a better story, somebody else will use it to tell a, a worse, more noxious one. You know, so so I, I, I you know I think the, the short answer is, is just it, if if you want to counter the effects of you know toxic messages in the media, the answer is never, oh, what magic wand can we wave to make things like they were 50, 60 years ago? You know, the good old days were not necessarily that great and you can't bring them back anyway. You have to be conscious of how things work today and use them conscientiously. Well, and how could audience like how could an average TV watcher kind of improve their diet because you talked a lot you talked about uh the the people who create media i think isn't there sort of another side of this too where the audience if the audience makes choices the market will respond to them eh? yeah i mean i think that's that's absolutely true it's you know it's it's kind of a vicious cycle um i think that if the audience rejects you know uh, fear mongering, then there's less incentive to put fear mongering on the air. If the audience rejects demonization, then there's less reason to put demonization on the air. Uh, I think that, you know, certainly one thing that audiences could do to, you know, to, to sort of lessen this effect is to try to broaden, uh, you know, their, their, their inputs and not only seek out messages that you know, sort of cater to them and make them feel good, uh, you know, which is not to say, um, you know, to accept every other message, but to, to hear other things. Of course, part of the problem with that is that if you're, if you're open-minded enough to make that kind of 
change, you know, then you are probably already a fairly open-minded person to begin with. Uh, but yes, I mean, certainly anything like this, you know, it, it, it takes two to tango, you know, there, there's the people putting things on the air and there's the audience receiving it. James, thank you so much for your time today on Daily Detroit. I I really appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule to talk about this. Oh, no problem. Thanks for talking to me about it. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the show. To me, there are so many people from Southeast Michigan who have gone on to do big things, both here and elsewhere, and it's great to talk to them. And I also think it's great that you took the time to listen to Your Daily Detroit. If you like what we're doing, tell a friend about the show or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It's very much appreciated. I'm Jer Stays. Take care of each other, and we'll see you around Detroit.